So here we are back at our model again. Simple dipole antenna, half wavelength at one gigahertz. One of the things that you can take advantage of with HFSS is something called remote solving, which is available under the HPC and analysis options. Remote solving allows you to define a set of machines that are connected to your workstation or laptop host machine that you can use as a remote solving engines. Um, you can define multiple configurations for multiple sets of machines, multiple sets of cores on a machine. Maybe you want to have a set for simple projects, medium-sized projects, and big projects. A number of different formats can be leveraged, UNC, DNS, even IP. In this example here, we're using the UNC name format for our remote machine. And you see it has a name field. We're not going to apply automatic settings. Hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about that later on. We want to go through manual just to give you a feel for exactly how this works. So in this setting, you define a number of tasks and total number of cores that the analysis will run. So this will run two tasks and it'll leverage a total of eight cores for the analysis. Here we are, we're making that remote machine configuration, the active setting. Now, the way this will work with those two tasks and eight cores is during the adaptive mesh process, there's only one single task running. That's the generation of the adaptive mesh. So all eight cores will be applied to the matrix solution. But then when we get to the frequency sweep, the best scalability we can achieve, assuming we have enough memory, is instead of applying all eight cores to each matrix solution, it's more efficient to actually solve multiple frequency points in parallel and dividing the available cores across those frequency points. And you'll see that's exactly what happens when we do an analyze all. It'll use a single task for the adaptive mesh and using eight cores. And then when it gets to the frequency sweep, it'll run two frequency points in parallel, the two tasks, and it'll divide those eight cores up between both of them. So it'll use four cores per frequency point. This is a fairly quick model to solve. It should just take a few adaptive passes to achieve convergence for delta S, and then we'll see it move into the frequency sweep. Okay, so after uh, five passes, it finished the adaptive meshing, and you see right now what's going on is it's solving multiple frequency points in parallel, two of them, according to that two-task uh, instruction for the HPC setup. Very quick analysis, just needed five or six sample points to uh, generating the interpolating sweep uh, curve fit. We get a message that the simulation is complete. Next, we'll show you how to do some post-processing on these results. So first place we're going to go to is the results branch. We'll do a right-click. We'll do... Um, Solution data, that'll just give us a quick snapshot of uh, information like the profile, which tells us meaningful information like the number of cores used, how much memory was leveraged for the different parts of the uh, solution process. Scroll down to the bottom, we can see multiple frequency points being solved at a time. That's what those distributed frequency labels mean. Four cores per frequency point to give us a total of the eight cores. By the way, that export button can be very useful if you ever want to export the profile to a text file that you might want to reference later on or just keep as your records for a simulation that you run. So now let's create some reports. We do a right click on results. We go to create modal solution data, rectangular plot. First plot we'll create will be the return loss of the parameter or S11. So uh, that's actually the default selection, S parameter quantity S11, and we'll do it in functional units of dBs. Click new report. And we create the plot here. Now notice this half wavelength dipole does not show a minimum at one gigahertz, and that's as expected. There is some additional capacitance associated with the finite size of the dipole. It does have a finite size radius. And so that actually sort of pulls the resonant frequency down. Another useful plot that we can generate when we're analyzing an antenna is again, go to create modal solution data, rectangular plot, and we can look at the Z matrix for the dipole antenna. A lot of times for antenna analysis, the Z matrix might be actually a more useful analysis. I like to do the Z matrix in both imaginary and real components. So I holding the control key down, I select imaginary and real, click new report, and that gives me the two plots in one report. One representing the real part of the input impedance, that's the red curve, and the imaginary part of the input impedance, which is the green curve. And indeed, notice that the green curve crosses zero at about 940 megahertz, which indeed just represents that this uh, antenna was resonant at 940 megahertz. Something that can be very, very useful is you can actually have multiple y-axes for your plots. So you can just click on the plot of interest in the plot definition, go down in the properties dialog and switch it from Y1 to Y2. You can have up to 20 different y-axis definitions. And this gives us two y-axis definitions for these two plots, uh, one for imaginary on the right-hand side and one for real on the left-hand side.
A very valuable set of capabilities from XY plots is available from a right click in the plot window. And these are known as trace characteristics. If we do a right click and we go to all, we see all the available trace characteristics like average of a plot across a frequency band, for instance. We have a number of math operations that we can perform on this data. And we can also define some favorites that we might want to use frequently and get to with some uh, quick right clicks and selections. In fact, what we'll do here is we're going to go again to a right click trace characteristics. We're going to pick up a favorite, which will be Y at a particular X value. When I create this, the default X value will be zero. And obviously zero gigahertz is not in this plot, but that's okay. Once I have it created, I can double click on that trace characteristics. And that'll bring up a properties window. And here I'll define my X value of interest. And my X value of interest will be one gigahertz, which will be my setter frequency. So what this will give me is it will give me a value for the imaginary real part of the Z matrix at one gigahertz. And indeed, you'll notice that the real part is about 98 ohms and the imaginary part is uh, 51 ohms. Again, so it's not resonant because it is a finite size half wavelength dipole at one gigahertz. Other things we can do with plots is we can right click on a plot definition and rename them, give them a meaningful name like Z matrix for the second plot and S parameters for the first.